So we understand the concept of CSPF and how it interacts with the IGP and the TED in order to build its own shortest path first tree. Now we need to dig into the algorithm itself a little bit deeper as to how it would actually come up with the shortest path first tree. This is understanding how it treats the constraints, which is actually the very first step when it comes to actually building the SPF. So we're gonna explore how the CSPF shortest path first tree is actually arrived at, and then introduce some of the bigger concepts in new nuances when it comes to calculating the CSPF, shortest path first tree, it all comes down to the tiebreaker, which is pretty fascinating, and it's actually the core topic of our very next nugget. In the meantime, let's get started talking about how CSPF arrives at the SPF tree that it calculates. So how does CSPF really do what CSPF does? How does it actually calculate the SPF with our constraints in mind? Keep in mind that the RSVP has the ability to work hand in hand with our IGP. In this case, I'm using ISIS. And we know that ISIS populates not only a link state database, but also the traffic engineering database. So when we tell PE3, hey, it's time to create an LSP to PE2, maybe from the loopback address, to the loopback address, without configuring anything else, RSVP will attempt to use CSPF to do this. And it does this in a couple different ways. The first thing is it looks in the TED database and it validates that none of the possible links will violate the bandwidth reservation constraint. So if we're telling PE3, we need you to build an LSP to PE2 and we need 500 megs of reserve bandwidth, it's going to look in the TED database and find out which interfaces don't have 500 available megs. So maybe it determines that GE000 here doesn't have the available bandwidth and GE002 here doesn't have the available bandwidth and this is what it does. It takes a copy of the link state database and it removes or prunes is the term that they like to use any of the links from the link state database that don't meet the constraint, like the bandwidth constraint. So from the results that are left over, these are the available links that it can calculate a shortest path first tree on. So step one is that it removes or prunes any of the links out of the copied LSDB that don't meet the requirements that it discovered in the TED. The second step that it does is it calculates a loop-free path to the egress. Critical to understand that this whole process is actually a few different steps of how it actually goes about calculating the path. It's going to attempt to calculate the path and then calculate return traffic and validate the whole time that it remains loop free. It does this again because it has access to the entire link state database, or at least out of the links that have been pruned out. And it can see things like what are the available paths that it would take? What is the speed that it would take to get there? What is the cost that it would take to get there? Because it still does see every single router's links based on what they've advertised. This isn't just what PE3's interfaces know. It's again, the link state database. Every device has shared every bit of info that it has on each of their own interfaces. And PE3 has all this information and therefore so does RSVP. It's kind of like having a roadmap. And after the pruning process, we've just eliminated some of the roads that we could use to get from point A to point B, narrowing it down to what roads we can take. Now what it does in step two is it's trying to figure out in that roadmap, how do I get from point A to point B without going in circles? based on all of the roads that are left over. Once it has a loop-free path, then it moves into the actual RSVP process. It starts with a path statement and it goes through the reservations, objects coming back. And this is how CSPF, the algorithm itself, really works. It's, it just begins by pruning out all of the links that don't meet the constraint requirements first. It is worth pointing out though, that when we actually build our path using CSPF, we can still use RSVP constraints like EROs. We can still tell PE3 that it should attempt to go through PE4 before it reaches PE2. If we were to set a loose ERO, sending it to PE4, CSPF would calculate this, but then set each of these hops as a strict ERO when it comes time to actually deploy the LSP. So now you want to see it in action, right? You want to see that CSPF really does work at the end of the day. Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to create the LSP going from PE3's loopback to PE2's loopback. We're going to maintain the loose ERO 
on GE001 of PE4. However, when CSPF actually calculates the path to get to loopback zero, it's going to set each one of these hops as a strict ERO. CSPF wants total control over the path that it should take because in the event that a failure occurs or any sort of path error occurs, CSPF will just recalculate an alternate path to get there. So here's how hard it is to actually configure CSPF to run. Without configuring any sort of admin groups or any sort of alternate traffic engineering, CSPF's really only focus that it cares about is performing the calculation based on any of the RSVP configurations, like our ERO that we configured, as well as the bandwidth reservation. It wants to make sure that the bandwidth reservation is met. So if I show you the current status of my configuration of protocols, here's how we have MPLS configured. CSPF is turned off. We're sending it to the loopback address of PE2. We're making a 100 meg reservation, and we're telling it to use our ERO, which sends it through PE4. What I want to do is I want to remove this statement right here so that CSPF performs the calculation of how to get to this, validating that the bandwidth reservation is met, and also calculating any alternate paths should the calculated LSP ever have any sort of node failure. So we're getting all of the benefits of the SPF algorithm combined with how RSVP actually signals LSPs. So just for the status quo, I'll show RSVP session. We see that I currently have a session up. Now what we're going to do is edit this configuration. We're going to delete the line that says no CSPF, and this will turn CSPF on. Now when it calculates its LSP, it's going to use the CSPF algorithm to validate that it has the best path to reach PE2's loopback. I'll commit and quit. And then I'm going to clear RSVP session all to bounce the session. Now it's going to take a couple seconds for this process to come to life and bring the RSVP LSP up. I'll say show RSVP session. It's not up yet. We'll just give it one moment, let it come to life, think about the world. It will come up. It just takes a few seconds the first time you run it. And there we go. After just a moment, I went from no output to an output with a down state to an output with an up state. It took about 10 seconds after I hit pause there on the recording to make this come to life. So let's take a look at what really happened here. I'm going to run the command show MPLS LSP. We're going to identify the LSP by the name of 2PE2. And then I want extensive output. If I make sure I get all of the output here, this is the log of actions that it took to actually get to the final destination and the final computation. Look right here, CSPF computation results set. And these are the IP addresses that it determined based on the TED and the LSDB that met this computation. This kept in mind our ERO, which had a loose hop towards this IP address right here. Then it also made sure that each of these interfaces also had the available bandwidth. So when we look up here at the computed ERO, we see that all of the hops that are available are in fact strict hops. And the RRO followed that path exactly. We even see that CSPF calculated the metric based on the IGP metrics. So this is our active path. And I think the kind of fascinating thing about this is I didn't turn anything on in ISIS and I didn't turn anything on in my MPLS or RSVP protocol. It just does this out of the box. The moment we set a bandwidth limitation or a bandwidth reservation, it begins checking out that TED database to make sure that the bandwidth reservation is going to be met. Same thing with the ERO. When we specify an ERO, it's going to validate our ERO, but then create its own ERO based on strict hops. So this validates how the CSPF algorithm actually works and how we can turn it on and configure it. We don't really turn anything on. We just configure RSVP and ISIS and it does the rest for us. Now in the next second, we're gonna talk about an exciting and interesting point to what happens when CSPF runs and it comes up with two paths that are equal in every way. They have the same cost, they have the same hop count. Therefore, which does CSPF pick in order to actually create the LSP? This is going to be the tiebreaker rule and how we can configure it. So get ready because this is going to be a big one. And it's gonna be a lot of fun. In the meantime, this has been getting CSPF up and running. Now you've seen it in action and you understand how the algorithm works. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.